I ain't gonna forget to put this thing on. Okay. <laughs> Told him, I said, if I forget to pull it off, let me know, but y'all ought to take it down. Right <laughs> How many of you got that 1611 weed? Let me see it right there. All right. All right. Keep it close and open your Bible uh, to Psalms chapter number 40, if you will. What we do is been mentioned about Brother Wayne. And I told Brother Wayne, I said, you need to go home, boy. <laughs> I'm sitting there in pain like that. I said, you go on home. You don't need to be here in misery, right? You don't need to do that. But, uh, you got a good man here, as you very well know. And uh, it's not the first time I've been here, but I've known him for years and years and years. And uh, he's faithful. And I listen to him on the radio. Man, he gets hot and heavy on there, don't he? <laughs> but I enjoy, I always enjoy hearing him. And I appreciate him asking me to come in this absence. I'm, I hate he had to go through what he did. But I always enjoyed being with you folks here. It's about like being at home. Yeah. Psalms chapter number 40 in your Bible, if you want to find your place. Uh, David said this, he said, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. Yeah. As you read this, this Psalms chapter 40, just the first few verses, is just about my testimony. And it'll probably be yours too. I think we'll see that in a minute before we get through but uh, to be able to look within and to know beyond a shadow of doubt that you know the Lord Jesus is the most important thing in the whole world. Amen. And, and David said, I waited patiently for the Lord. And thank God he inclined to me and heard my cry. You know, the, the, one of the probably most common verses that we read in the Bible is Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Now, you'd think everybody in the world heard that. That's what you'd think. But I was saved in 1968, and uh, I was not raised in church. My family was not in church. And I know very little about the Bible. Now, that don't mean I've never, never been to church. I had. You know, back in my day, and uh, some of y'all are in my league of being in my day. <laughs> I'm 78, so... Some of you is about there. If you're not, you're getting there, right? Yeah. But uh, in my day, every neighborhood had at least one Baptist and one Methodist church. You remember that? Mm -hmm. And uh, the outreach of the church is there. And I could go when I did. I had buddies that were sent to church. And once in a while, I'd go there for that and so forth. But other than that, I, I just didn't go to church. I, if I wanted to, I did. And uh, as I went to Heights Methodist Church over on a place they called Greasy Hill, and it, it was, I don't have time to tell you about the reason they called it that, but it was the reason for it. But uh, two things I always went to church for and liked. At first, they had a scout troop, and I liked that. I liked to go camping and that sort of thing. They had girls. There's two things I liked. <laughs> and some of you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. I see you smile real big when I said that. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way. But during that length of time that I was there, I'm sure that I'd heard the gospel, no doubt about it. <clears throat> but I've never heard that verse, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Never had mm -hmm. until the day that a fellow named Danny Smith, mm -hmm. for the Danny pastors of Samaritan Baptist Church now, mm -hmm. but I met him at Reynolds Biker Company. He and I worked at 256 on night shift. And uh, he's a fellow that made the Lord, by the way. But I never heard it before that time. And I never will forget when he showed me the verse. And uh, I said, Brother Danny, that sounds mighty simple. He said, well, it's simple for you, but it wasn't simple for the Lord. And look what he had to do to provide that way. Right. And thank God that a loving Savior made a simple way that a sinful man could reach him. Amen. And uh, thank God for it. But David said, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. And notice what he said, and you can relate that, I'm sure, to your own testimony. He said, he brought me up. You see that? He brought me up. And I'm glad that God always takes a person from the bottom to the top. Always brings us up. Always does. I'm glad that there's no life that a person lived, I don't care how sinful it was, is that the Lord can't bring them up. It doesn't matter. No matter what you've done, where you've been, no matter. 
Hey, God can always bring you out. He always brings you up. He always makes your life better, a whole lot better than what it was. But watch what he said. He said he brought me up out of the horrible pit and out of the miry clay. And that's exactly what he does to you and me. He brings us out of the life of sin. Amen. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Right. And old things have passed away, but all things have become new. Amen. But thank God he cleans us up from the inside out. Because I'm, if you like me during the days, and I hate to admit it, but I lived a life far away from God. Uh, now, I never was an atheist, and I never was, been that stupid. Hey, but as far as living for God, it just didn't enter my mind. Mm -hmm. Didn't want to. Didn't care to. I was involved in every kind of vice you could think of out here in this world. Got introduced to the alcohol at about the age of 12, and uh, because my family was like that. Yeah. And uh, you get a person that's involved in that, I don't care what age they are, you can just bet they're going to go down, down, down. Right. But, uh, you know, the Lord brings us out the miry clay he brings us out Amen. and he goes on to say this here now you watch this and you can relate to this and he said he set my feet upon a rock yeah, yeah. well we know this that that rock that he's talking about is the Lord Jesus Christ yeah. Yeah. you know if somebody said this that's the rock it won't roll mm -hmm. and that's a rock it won't move yeah. and that's a foundation that's sure he set my feet upon a rock, upon a solid rock is what he did. And watch this, he established my goings. You know, the Bible says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. But when we come to know the Lord Jesus, we see things in a different light mm -hmm. altogether. There's one thing that God changes about everybody when they get saved. Every it's one thing that they do, okay? And, uh, you know, all of us don't see alike sometimes when it comes to uh, different things that we do. Some people think, well, there's nothing wrong with this or that, and I ain't talking about sinful things, I'm just talking about habits or whatever it may be. All of us don't see it alike. Some of us think we would have long hair, some of us think we would have short hair, and some of us think we don't have no hair. <laughs> hey, but... All of us don't have the same standards. But here's the thing that changed in my life and your life too the day that you got saved. That the things of God took on a new meaning. Yeah. We begin to see things in a different light. Now for myself, as I mentioned, I never wanted to go to church on Sunday morning unless I just wanted to go. The Bible didn't mean anything to me so far as spending time reading it. Yes. You know, I never was one to disbelieve it or try to discount it or something like that. In fact, I didn't even like gospel songs, to be honest with you. I'd rather be here Jerry Lee Lewis, the Fast Domino, one of them. <laughs> you probably the same way. Yes. Hey, but all that changed when I got saved. The things of God takes on a new meaning to everybody at that time. You yeah. see it different. Well, why? It's because we met the Lord Jesus Christ. He changed our, our life. And then he, he notice what he said in that third verse. And said, he had put a new song. He's put a new song. Amen. <laughs> I like that. In my mouth, what? Even praise unto our God. And many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. Now, when I look at that, I look at my testimony. I look at what happened to me some 55 years ago. And uh, rejoice in the fact to speak to you this morning on the fact of the joy of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. But then what? But then what? Mm. You know, this story has been told many, many times, the illustration given, about a young man that was getting ready to graduate from high school. And uh, there was one of the counselors or teachers or something that sat down with him and was talking with him about his future. And they sat down and they said, well, son, so you're graduating from high school now, and, and now what's your future plans? And he said, well, I plan on going to college. I've already been accepted and so forth. And I want to go to increase my knowledge. He said, as you know, my dad's got a business, and I'd like to go and, and just major and 
you know, in business and come back and have part of my dad's business. He said, son, that's really great, but what then? What then? Well, the young fella thought for a while. He said, well, he said, I'd like to settle down and do well in the business and uh, be thought worthy one of these days of taking that business over. He said, well, that's really good, son, but then what? Then what? He said, well, should I maybe like to think that maybe I'd meet the right girl and, and maybe get married and even maybe have children. He said, well, son, that's great, but what then? He said, well, maybe the children could grow up. One day they could take the business. My dad would retire and uh, my kids could take it over. Then I would, you know, retire myself. And uh, he said, well, that's great, son. Then, then what? He said, well, I'd like to think maybe my retired years I could, you know, I could enjoy things and so forth and so on. He said, well, that sounds good, but what then? And he said, well, you know, I guess then I'd die. He said, well, what then? Well, what a sobering thought that is to think about that, even, even for you and I today. Because we do know this, that either the Lord's coming back or we'll meet death one of these days. Uh, it's not a year goes by that I don't have at least 40 funerals, at least that. And I have them for all ages. I've had them mm -hmm. from three months old on up to over 100. So we don't ever know. None of us are guaranteed to have another day. Right. And we don't know that. But we do know that one of these days is going to come to an end. Yeah. And the only thing that's going to matter at that time is do we know the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Not do we know about Him, no. Do we know the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's a big difference in knowing about the Lord and knowing the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean to be reverent with what I'm fixing to say, but you could have run across me when I was about 18, 19, 20 years old out here in a bar room somewhere because that's why I, at a beer joint or someplace like that where I usually was. And you could say, Frank, let me ask you something. Do you believe there's a God? I'd say, yes, sir. I do. And I did. Do you believe there was a Jesus Christ? Yes, sir. I, I believe that. And I did. Do you believe he died on the cross and all this? Yes, sir. I did. And I had it all up here. I did believe that. I knew about him, but I didn't know him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference in that. So make sure we don't fumble through life and just we got it all in our head but not in our heart. Mm -hmm. But you think about the joy this morning of knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. Don't ever let anybody make you think that you can't know that you're saved. Now, I know Stokes County, and I know there's a lot of churches around here that would tell you that you can't know that till you die. But it's a little late to find out then, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, you can know that. First John chapter 5, if you were to read as it talks about the Lord Jesus and what He did for us. Verse number 13, it says, And these things write I unto you, that believe on the name of the Son of God, now listen carefully, that you may know that you have eternal life. That you may know that. Oh yeah, you can know that you have eternal life. And uh, you know, the thing of it is, is that we know that we're saved, and we know we're safe for all eternity, because when God saves a person, He don't just save them and leave them. No, He saves you and keeps you saved. Yeah. Oh yeah. We're saved by grace. We're kept by the power of God. Jesus said in John chapter number 10, beginning verse number 27, He said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. And neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Yeah. So here we are today. Hey, we're saved. We're safe. We're secure. Heaven is going to be our home one of these days. And thank God that we know that. You know, we look around us today, and we see this world and the situation this world is in. Our brother had mentioned something about it at the introduction. We have never lived in a day like 2023. Oh, we have never seen sin abound and accepted and applauded like we do right now. Right. But in First Timothy chapter number 3, you know, that talks about 
the days of the Lord. He said, this know that in the last days perilous times will come. That's right. And it's got a long list of things. Men going to be lovers of herself and so forth. You've read it, you know what I'm talking about. But he gets down to verse number 13. He says this. He said, but this know that evil men and seducers are wax worse and worse. Yeah. And so it ought not to be it ought not to be no surprise when we see things happening the way they are. Yeah. When we see the depravity of man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now if you remember John said back in 1 John, he said the spirit of Antichrist is in our world today. Yeah. Well friends, now you think today about the depravity we're in. You think today about how everything seems like it's going toward that way. Why is that? You know, there's not but one answer to that, and it's simply this. is that the spirit of Antichrist has captured the minds of the unbelievers today. Yeah. There's no other, there's no other uh, way that you can say that, that, you know, that's not the reason. Mm -hmm. I mean, they make decisions today to kill millions of little babies. Yeah. Yeah. And they make, kill, uh, they make, they, they make uh, today, make reasons now for people to live immoral lives. And applaud it, by the way. Mm -hmm. And it's just gone south today. It has. You know, a lot of times we say, "Well, we got a we got a, the wrong kind of party in." Well, I would agree with that. But <laughs> our problem today does not rest totally in a political party. That's right. That's not the problem that That's we have today. Right. The problem that we got today is men do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Right. Right. How can we expect them to make decisions when they don't know <coughs> the decision maker? Yeah. We're in trouble today. We're in trouble. And here we are, you know, we're saved and safe and on our way to heaven. But what did God save us to do? Did He save us just to take us to heaven? No, I don't believe He did. Now that's one of the things He saved us to do. But no, He didn't save us just to take us to heaven. He left us here to be salt and light and to point men and women and boys and girls to the Lord. Mm -hmm. The problem that we have today is men are lost. And we have the answer to men's problem today, you and I that know the Lord. We've got the answer for it. Now, you know the Bible says if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Whom the glorious light of the gospel has not shined into them. Hey, the devil has blinded their minds to what the truth is. But he's put us, he's put us in control of the gospel, so to speak. In fact, in, in 1 Thessalonians 2, it says that we have been entrusted with the gospel. And so you and I today that are saved, hey, it is our responsibility to take the gospel out here to this lost and dying world. And we can sit back and we can criticize about this, that, and that, or we want to. And by the way, they deserve a lot of criticism. Hey, but what are we doing? You know, it's, it might be like this. That we would say, well, you know, thank God we're saved. Thank God we're saved. Thank God we're on the way to heaven. But what then? What are we doing then? In the meantime, what are we doing? And are we doing our part? Are we doing that? Hey, to capture the souls of men and women. Now, folks, you remember this, that somebody loved me and you one day enough Amen. to tell us about the Lord. Yeah. Somebody did. Yeah. And that responsibility now is passed on to me and it's passed on to you. And are we doing our part? Are we doing that? You see, there's always ways to witness. God's made so many ways now for you and I to witness to other people. There's a lot of times I've, I've heard people say this, well, Brother Frank, I don't know. It's just hard for me to, to know just how to explain to people you know how to get saved. You know what you can do? Pick up one of your gospel tracts that's here. And if nothing else, sit down and read it to them. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, there's no excuse for that. And God has made so many ways for you and I to communicate. We live in a day of communication. You know that? Yeah. Hey, the computer and telephone and Everything else you can think about is a witness to people. Are we doing our part? Are we doing that? I want you to turn your Bibles to 
Acts chapter number 8. And I just want to remind you of, of, uh, of the great people that we have in the Word of God that we admire today, that we talk about today, and how that God used them and what did they do. You know, I guess one of the greatest examples that we have in the Bible of a witness has to be the Apostle Paul. You know, uh, Paul, as he was known as Saul, you know, before he got saved, mm -hmm. and the day that he met the Lord Jesus there on the Damascus Road, and uh, from that day on, this man was unstoppable. There was no way that you could stop him. You put him in jail, he'd win the jailer. And you'd seen him to court, he'd witness to the judge, he'd witness to the governor, he'd witness to whatever. In fact, he said this, he said, I have not shunned, I have not shunned to give the gospel to everybody that I've ever met. Now, I can't say that. I wish I could, but I cannot. But I ought to, okay? But Paul here, everywhere he went, he was preaching the gospel, preaching the gospel, seeing people saved. Well, here in Acts chapter number 8, we have the account that I'm sure that you're so familiar with. I'll paraphrase part of it, but there are some things I want to show you out of that. Of a man called Philip. Now, Philip was one of the early deacons in the church, okay? And he's holding a revival meeting, as we might say this. And the Lord spoke to him and he said, Philip, I want you to go down to a place called Gaza. There's, there's one man that I want you to witness to. Now, you would think to yourself, if you're I'm holding a revival meeting, we're seeing people saved, and just one man, one man. Hey, do we know the worth of a soul? Yeah. You know the Bible says that one soul is worth more than the whole world. Right. One soul. I mean, you'd find some of those dirty, snotty-nosed kids somewhere out here that has nothing. Hey, they're worth more than the world's their soul is. You know, a lot of times that we forget that, but when we think about that soul, if that soul was our brother or sister or mother or father or our kid or grandkid, we would say it's worth more than the whole world. Mm -hmm. One soul is worth more. Yeah. And so God spoke to it. He said, go down to this way of Gaza. There's a man down there. I want you to notice something about this fellow, if you would, beginning in verse number 26. It says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, said, Arise, go toward the south, and to the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is the desert. Now watch what happened. And it said that he arose. He arose. Now watch. Do you know that we must be obedient to the call of the Word of God mm -hmm. to go out and witness to people? Do you remember the last words of the Lord Jesus Christ right before He went back to heaven? In Acts chapter number 1, verse number 8, he said, But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. And he began to enumerate the places. It's like, like saying this. It's like you to be a witness right here at your back door. And then you to be a witness throughout town. And then you to witness throughout the county. And then you to witness throughout the state. And then to the uttermost parts of the world. And there's ways and means by the way we can do that. You see, all of us is from different walks of life, as I look around and see, different ages. Some of you's got jobs that you go to every day, and some of you just meander around the neighborhood and go down to the service station and have a big day, get you a cocoa and a pack of peanuts and sit there and talk and chew the fat. Some of you go to school. Hey, but every place you go, you got people that you can witness to, people you can witness to. And uh, we need to see that, that one soul, one soul, is worth it all, but we have to go. You ever notice this, that the word gospel, hey, the first two letters is go? You ever notice that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> have you ever noticed in the word God, the first two letters is go? Go? And that's exactly what we're to do, is to go. So here he went, now he said he rose, and it said, Behold, a man of Ethiopia. I want you to notice this carefully, if you would. This man of Ethiopia right here. And, uh, and uh, he, uh, a eunuch of great authority under Candice, queen of the Ethiopians. Watch. Who had the charge of all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem for to what? Worship. He came there to worship. You see that? Now here's a man that was totally ignorant of the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. But he was hungry. 
Uh, he was searching. Uh, he wanted to know the truth. He was going down to the place to worship to where he was going, okay? He wasn't going down there to a party, but to worship. He was a, he was a hungry soul. Now let me tell you something, this world is full of hungry souls out here. Now, you know, no doubt, there, last night around any community you want to go to, there was people seeking after peace and happiness and so forth. Yeah. And they'd done it some through drugs and some through alcohol, maybe some through an immoral life or whatever it may be. But what they're doing is they're seeking for peace and happiness what they're seeking for. <laughs> But they'll never find it in that. Right. You know why? Because God has not made a way except through His Son that you can have peace in your heart. Yeah. Right. You'll never find peace and happiness apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. But here's a man that was hungry. Let me tell you something. They're everywhere you go. Everywhere you go, you, there's people hey, that's waiting for somebody to come witness to it. Yeah. Okay? And sometimes, sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we'll back off. Hey, sometimes we see somebody, maybe they're a little rough looking or whatever it may be, and boy, we got some nowadays. That really, hey, they really take that on, don't they? And we say, well, I don't know about that. Hey, they got a soul like everybody else. Yeah. They need somebody to witness to right. them, Somebody to do that. In my lifetime, since I've been saved, I've been to every kind of person you can think of. Hey, I've dealt with Hell's Angels and had funerals for several of them and knew several of them and so forth. You know what I found out? That most of them, most every one of them will respect you if you'll respect them. Most mm -hmm. of them will. But they're waiting for somebody to reach out. Reach out. Yeah. So here this man, he had a hungry heart. He was going down, hey, to worship. That's what he was going for. I want you to notice, if you would, uh, the uh, next verse. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot reading Isaiah the prophet. And the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. It says, And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said unto him, Understandest thou what thou readest? I want to show you a couple of things right here. Now watch. Number one, he had went down to the temple and he didn't get his needs met. And as you know, there's many churches today that people will go to and they'll never get their needs met. Yeah. They'll come in and they'll have somebody rock them to sleep. Yep. They'll have come in. They'll come in and have some so-called preacher stand in the pulpit and tell them, "Well, you be good. Mm -hmm. You know, do the best you can." I don't think about that. Our town's not that big, you know. <laughs> I mean, just join the church. You know, look happy. You know, put on the front. And God loves everybody. Now He does that. Hey, but God loves us so much He won't overlook judgment either. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, but they do that. There's, there's so many of you. I've said this, and I believe this to be true. That I believe that religion will send more people to hell than yeah, sin. Amen. That's right. Yes, you think today about the millions and millions of millions mm -hmm. of religions that we got today that don't even believe Jesus Christ was God. Mm -hmm. Your Mormons is like that. Oh yeah, they don't. They don't believe that. And there's more to do too. But there are just as many that preach a social gospel. Yeah. Now, you know, let me tell you something, friend. The devil would soon send you to hell from a church pew as he had a bar room. It don't matter. Oh, yeah. yep. He can deceive you either way. He went down to the temple to worship, but he didn't get his need met. But somebody gave him a copy of Isaiah 53. I can kind of see this. I can see some... The little fella down there, maybe some little girl, they give him a gospel track of Isaiah 53. The importance, by the way, of getting the gospel out any way you can. Mm -hmm. Well, he's coming back reading that, and uh, Philip run up to the chariot. Don't you like that zeal that he had? And he said, do you understand what you're reading? Do you understand? I want you to watch this next verse, because it's a classic, verse number 31. And he said... How can I except some man should guide me? You see that? Mm -hmm. He said, how can I understand salvation unless somebody guides me? Well, you know, it was like that for me and you one day. Yeah. You know, we have our own ideas about things until God sent somebody in our life yeah. 
hey, to explain to us what salvation was all about. How can I? Did you know that God don't send angels down here to witness to people? No, He sends mm -hmm. people down here. Yeah. He sends me and you down here. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm saved. I'm safe. I'm on my way to heaven. But what then? What am I doing in the meantime? What am I supposed to be doing in the meantime? Hey, what has God got me here for in the meantime? He's got me here one thing. Hey, it's to spread the gospel. To spread the gospel and tell people how to be saved. So here he is, and he said those famous words, how can I understand unless somebody guides me? Yeah. Well, now, you know, you and I need to take it today and see this, is that I am that man. Hmm. I am that person. It is my responsibility to take the gospel. Now, look, I know there's a lot of times that you witness, and you witness to people, and sometimes it does some good, and sometimes it don't. But we know this. If we don't witness to anybody, we ain't going to ever see anybody saved. Right. You know, in John chapter number 10, you don't have to turn in your Bible. I know most of you will. Right off, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about here. But the Lord Jesus now, is He's calling His disciples. And there was a man called Andrew. He was one of the first ones that Jesus called. And Andrew, it says in John chapter number 1, verse number 40 through 42, is that the first thing that Andrew did after he got saved is that he went and got his brother. Well, who was his brother? His brother was Peter. But first, he said, he went and got his brother. Now, folks, let me leave this with you. You know, in our witness, and I know that there's a lot of times is that it seems like that our family is some of the hardest people in the world to witness to. Yeah. Now, I know that, okay? And yet, I want you to think about this is that God has me here and you here too hey, just to do that very thing. And if He can keep us from doing that, He's going to keep us from a very important thing. Yeah. When I got saved, I had one brother. He was three years older than me, but me and him lived the same kind of life. Terrible life. And uh, after I got saved, I just couldn't even fathom the thing of that boy going to hell. I mean, every time I think about that, man, it just tear me up. I used to, we had, used to, we had a big 55 gallon drum out in the backyard, we'd burn our garbage on. You know, you do that now, they put you in jail, but <laughs> we didn't know nothing about it. Hey, we'd go out there and I'd see the flames coming, I'd see my brother in there. I said, Lord, I can't bear the thoughts of my brother going to hell. I just can't bear the thoughts of him. And I witnessed to him, I'd give him tracts, prayed for him. And so forth. And I can say this, my brother never was, he never was rude to me. But I'd go to his house to witness to him, and I've had him do this all the most times. I'd come to the front door, he'd go out the back. Get on his lawnmower, that's most of the time what he'd do. I told him it's snowing out there, Fred, you don't need the lawnmower. <laughs> he would, he'd get on his lawnmower. Wouldn't get off till I left. Or he'd find something to do. He didn't want to talk to me about it. I prayed for him, talked to him, prayed for him, prayed for him. Sometimes got discouraged to be honest with you. But I thought to myself, he, he seemed like more I prayed for him, worse he got sometime, you know. But I kept praying and kept praying and kept praying for him. Prayed for him for seven long years. I've been up to Forsyth County Detention Shelter uh, preaching. I used to go up there every week, went up there for about 42 years to preach to the closed place. And I was coming home and had a good night, was really feeling good. And uh, went in the house my wife. She said, boy, something happened tonight you've been praying for for years. I thought, I don't want the public to clear the house $10 million. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, what was it? She said, your brother got saved. Mm -hmm. Your brother got saved. Went long before the phone rang, and he called me and told me about it. All right, now listen, here about five years ago, uh, I preached his funeral. He got a kid in a car wreck out here on Interstate 40. And I'm going to tell you, I stood there and it was a sad time. I think about my brother practically every day. I didn't have a one. Yeah. And I could, uh, my, my brother was laying there in that casket. But I'm going to tell you something. I had peace in my heart because I knew where he was at. Mm -hmm. I knew he was safe. Yeah. All those prayers didn't mean a thing at that time about what you had to do. All those tracts I'd give out, 
And listen, it was worth every minute of it. Mm -hmm. Now here's what I'm saying. Of all people that you need to be going to is your family. Mm -hmm. And it had been a whole lot easier, my friend, hey, for me to stood there and preach that boy's funeral and me knowing where he was. And if I'd have stood there and thought I never tried. I never tried. That's going to be a sad time for a people when they do that. Mm -hmm. And I say to you going back, there's nobody so hard there's nobody so hard that the Spirit of God can't bring them down. Yeah. Now, I ain't talking about cramming something down somebody's throat. Mm -hmm. What I'm talking about is going back to them again, speaking to them one more time, telling them about how they need the Lord. Mm -hmm. Let them know you love them. Oh, yeah. I'm talking about the importance <coughs> of it. I'm talking about the thing of witnessing. I'm talking about God giving me boldness hey, to stand up where I'm at and to speak up. You know, it's an amazing thing sometimes is that uh, we can have boldness to speak about everything but the Lord. <laughs> hey, we can talk about political parties, we can talk about the Super Bowl, we can talk about ball games, we can talk about everything else. Readily do that. We can hear somebody mention that, and we're going to chime in, boy, and we're going to give our opinion about it. Well, it's time we chimed in and started talking about the Lord. Amen? I'm talking about the importance of it. Mm -hmm. Hey, we're saved. Thank God we are. <laughs> You know, we're on our road, road to heaven. Thank God we are. In fact, I'm looking forward to it. Amen. Hey, the, the closer I get, the better off I like it, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I've had, uh, my wife has been, for a couple of years, she's had this dementia, and she had a lot of other things. She's in pretty bad shape. And uh, I just asked God, I said, God, just help me to live long enough to look after her. That's, all, that's my request. Yes. After that, I'm ready to go, buddy. I'm ready. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, but in the meantime, in the meantime, what are we doing? You think about what we need and the obedience that we need to the Word of God. Yeah. And one of, the, one of the things that we do many, many times we were not to is we procrastinate. Yeah. I'm going to. I'm going to. We'll never get around to it. Remember John 4? Jesus won the lady at the well there in Samaria. Remember that? And if she, she goes back into town and gets the men and comes back and Jesus meets his disciples. And apparently they said unto him, well, we're going to have to come back in this place in about three or four months and we're going to have to have a tent revival or something. Because Jesus said to them, say not here, there are yet four months and then come a harvest. Uh -huh. He said, I say, look on the fields now. They're white to harvest. Now they tell me that wheat, when it got white, is overripe. He said, it's white to harvest. He said, now is the time. Well, you know, that right there is what I need to see. Hey, the fields are ripe. The fields are ripe. We just need people to get out there in it. And you know, just one final thing about that, I'm talking about just a, you know, just a challenge set forth to the people of God. How we need that. As hell is real. <coughs> hell is real. I don't know if you ever stopped to think about that, about the horrors of hell. You ever think about a place where a man goes, he's not never able to get, get out. He'll never have a friend. He'll never see another day, another day without misery, except at the great white throne judgment when they have to stand there. Never will. Hell's a terrible place. But every person that we meet Every person in this room right here is either going to spend eternity in heaven or in hell. Yeah. Now, we'll make that choice. No, God don't make the choice for you. Uh-uh. No, no, you make the choice. Okay? And it must be made now. <coughs> must be. Unless you and I get a vision of that in such a way is that when we leave this place that we're ready. Stuff traps in your pocket. Do everything you can hey, to be a witness to people. Let's bow our heads and we're going to have a closing word of prayer. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And here this morning, I want you to think there's heads are bowed, nobody's looking around, we certainly don't embarrass anybody. But there could be somebody here that you don't know the Lord. Now you know about it, you know about it, but you really you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the God's give you one more opportunity, one more. Ma'am, sir, whoever you may be, to hear the gospel. Will you accept it today? 
The invitation will be given. And if you'd step out and come down to the front, I'll have our brother standing down here. And just take him by the hand, and he'll have somebody take you aside and show you how to be saved. But if you're here today, whoever you may be, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands on that this morning about that, but you know who you are. Don't leave this place today lost. Don't leave this place today lost. You have no guarantee of another day. And then you and I, as Christians, maybe you, as I was talking about that, maybe you have somebody on your mind, somebody that's lost. Do you love them enough to pray for them? Do you love them enough to go for them? Would we be willing today to do this, each and every one of us? It's to ask God to fill us with the Spirit of God and give us the boldness, the witness. And if we would set a goal of saying this, Lord, help me to witness to somebody every day in some way. God help us to do that. Lord, as the invitation is given here today, I pray you'd work in the hearts of men and women, boys and girls. Help those that need to make a decision to come and make it today. And we ask the prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand our feet with our heads bowed and our eyes closed.